The first lab we usually do with lenses is with a converging lens. And what we do is we have a bright object, in this case a candle. We put it a certain distance from the lens, and then we look for where a real image forms. You can find that pretty easily. If you take a note card, the uh, note card, if it's in the location of the real image, you'll see it in focus on the screen. We use what's called a meter stick optical bench that lets us easily move these different uh, components around. So there's a couple of things to notice. Um, the first is that the real image is inverted. And the second is that it's a different size than the actual candle. So all of these things are related to each other, um, as well as to where the location of the image is. And the purpose of this lab is to discover the rules that govern that. What I usually have students do is take a selfie and then use that selfie as the object. If they turn the brightness way up on their phone, uh, you could actually make a, an image on a note card using one of these lenses. And the independent variable, the one that we change, is the object. We move it different locations from this lens, and then an image forms in different places. So the object distance, which usually would be the thing we changed, gets labeled SO for distance object. S is traditional here. The note card is the image. So SI for image distance. Now, we need to sort of ask ourselves, is there any way geometrically we can see ahead of time on where this image is going to form? One way to do that is with what are known as the principal rays. Every point along this object is sending light out at lots of different angles, which are being collected by the lens to make the image. But there's three of them that are easy to figure out where they come back together. And the easiest to understand is what's known as the central ray. So if I have a line leaving the head of this guy and passing right through the middle of the lens, the head of my image is going to be on that line. The reason this is not deflected, it's not easy to see in this sketch, but in a real lens, this light would be hitting the surface as perpendicular, so it would not uh, bend according to Snell's law. That doesn't determine uh, where this is. This could be anywhere along this line. In order to get an idea of where the image is, we need to know something else about the lens. A converging lens is going to take parallel beams of light and it's going to bend them and make them all pass through a point, which is known as the focal point. So different curvature on the lens is going to shift this focal point around. And that's going to be really important for us in figuring out where the image distance is for any given object. Let's see why. So let's send a parallel beam of light, so parallel to the central axis, from the head of my object. Now, we know of course that since it's leaving the head of my object, it's gonna hit the head of my image. So I'll make that connection. But notice it's passing through the center here. It's being deflected to a point right here. And that's actually the focal point of this lens. Any other parallel beam of light would be deflected through that point. So it's not that for any given object distance, the image ends up at the focal point. But because the parallel ray bends through the focal point, the fact that the image is in this case right here, it tells us that the focal point must be in here. So as we shift the object around, the image is going to shift around, but this ray is always going to continue to pass through the focal point. 
Notice that these two are converging on uh, the opposite side of the central axis. Um, that's what really helps me justify the fact this image is inverted. Also notice it's a different size than the object. One final thing, these two, the parallel ray and the central ray can help you find an image. You feel much better if you have a third one. And the third one is what's known as the focal ray. So I'm gonna draw the focal point just as far on this side as this one is on that side. I'm gonna draw a third ray that leaves the head and hits the lens after passing through the focal point. This is kind of the opposite of the parallel ray. And the lens bends this one parallel. And as you can see, it converges. People have studied optics for a long time. And the equation that they've come up with is known as the thin lens equation. One over the object distance plus one over the image distance equals one over the focal length. So what we're going to do is look at data for lots of different object distances. Look at the image that they form. Look at those data. And we're going to try to see if this equation holds true. It's hard to make a video of this because I'm filming this on my phone and my object is going to be a selfie on the phone. But basically, what we're going to do is place an object three centimeters away. And we're going to move that note card around to find the image. Uh, I'm then going to repeat every two centimeters. So here's the results I got. And you can see an image distance of five is a really big deal. As I started to move my object farther and farther away, where the image was approached five and never really changed. So I actually didn't end up getting that many more useful data points. So I went back and put in some of the even centimeter distances from the lens just so I get some more data. So here's all the data combined together. We'll sort that by object distance. Again, just to see sort of qualitatively what's going on. And I think we can see that when we're close to five, we have an image that's really far away. But as we up our object distance, as we move the phone farther away from the lens, the image gets closer and closer to the lens and then peaks at five. It doesn't go past it. So that five is obviously something really, really important. Because notice that we get our farthest away image when our object is close to five. And when we have far away objects, the image forms close to five. So five is probably what the focal length of this lens is. Notice I don't have three centimeters on here. I checked three centimeters. I couldn't form an image anywhere. So that would imply if five is indeed the focal length, that putting your object inside the focal length of the lens makes it impossible to form a real image. So if this equation does indeed describe the relationship between focal length, object, and image distance, we should be able to linearize it, A, as a check to see whether it's true, and B, a way to find the focal length and see if it is indeed five. We said the object distance where I put the phone is my independent variable and the, the dependent variable is the image distance where I put the note card. So I'm gonna get the independent variable by itself. So I just subtracted one over SO from both sides. And now I'm going to line that up next to y equals mx plus b. On the y-axis, apparently, we ought to have 1 over image distance. On the x-axis, 
we're going to have 1 over object distance. So what's the slope here? I'm guessing it's just the negative sign. And that means the intercept for this graph ought to be pretty important. We ought to see it being the inverse of focal length. So expecting something like this, where whatever this intercept is, is 1 over f. So here's our data. And as you can see, we do have the negative slope we expected. We kind of have a plateau up here. Um, at an inverse image distance of 0.2. And if you look in the data, that's because at some point we really stopped being able to tell if we were significantly different from 5 centimeters as the location of the image. Um, I suspect there, there probably is some variation between these object distances and where the image distance is, but it's so close to 5 centimeters we really couldn't check it. So I think we should probably just use the last data point we were able to actually check and kind of get rid of the extra ones because this plateau is sort of distorting the shape of the graph. So I'm just going to clear that data. And there we go. So we do have a slope of approximately negative 1 as predicted. And our inverse focal length is 0.26. So 1 divided by 0.26. So we're calculating a, a focal length of about 4. Um, so that means there is some error uh, in our, our lab. We were seeing everything kind of converge around 5 centimeters, but our data, which, which shows a pretty strong correlation, is suggesting the focal length is about 4. I suspect this comes from measurement error and just the difficulty of figuring out exactly where the lens is, where the paper screen is, but I'm not really sure about that discrepancy. I am very confident in this trend though. We have a lot of data that supports it. Optics is a favorite topic of mine because one of my hobbies is collecting and using vintage cameras. Uh, I thought I would use a couple to maybe shine a light on the things we're studying with this experiment. Um, cameras start with a lens, and the lens is considerably more complicated than the thin lenses we've been looking at. There's multiple pieces of glass in here that, that do a lot with the light. But they focus an image at the very back of the camera. And on an old rangefinder film camera like these, at the very back, there's photographic film and it's held in place by a pressure plate like this. So it's right at the very back. And we've got to see how the lens and adjusting the lens can help us get an image in exactly the place we need it to be. The first thing I want to do is look at why, as you move an object farther and farther and farther away, the image appears to be right at the focal point. We're going to take a look at what happens as the object starts very far away from the focal point. Uh, so far away we can almost consider it infinitely far away. And then gets closer and closer to the focal point. So I'm going to draw the principal ray diagrams for these different situations. So we can see that if our object is very far away, a distance we call infinity, the image is basically right at the focal point on the opposite side. As we move the object closer, the image moves a little farther away from the opposite focal point. Even closer, it moves farther away. If we're right on top of the focal point, it's hard to see where the rays would actually intersect. It's clearly way off the paper. So right now my lens is focused on infinity, and it's relatively short. If I want to focus on something that's much closer, I turn the focus knob, and you can see the lens appears to grow. It appears to get uh, farther away from the camera body. Maybe the ray diagrams can help explain this. So when we're focused on a faraway object at infinity like this, the image is at the focal point, 
and is really close to where the lens is. Hence the, the shorter lens. As we focus on something further, the image is farther back behind the focal point. So we have the lens get longer to move the optical elements out. At infinity, the image is at the focal point. Much closer, the image is behind the focal point. We can also explain why when we moved the object inside the focal length, we didn't see any image. On this side of the lens where we would expect to find the image, the rays don't converge anymore. It turns out there is another kind of image, not one you could put on a screen, called a virtual image. And we could find it by backtracking our rays and seeing that they appear to somebody over here as if they had diverged from this point. We'll see why that's useful in another video, but it's definitely not going to get us a picture that we can uh, record on film or, or a sensor. One of the things that sometimes messes with people in ray diagrams is that although the principal rays are really important for locating an image, because we pretty much always can find them by doing our parallel, central, and focal rays, um, they're, they're certainly not the only rays of light leaving the object that make the image. And if we were to block any of these rays, say by physically obstructing part of the lens, like what if I blocked all of this like that? Would an image still get through? The answer is absolutely. Because Although these rays would now be gone, there are plenty of other rays that still get through that smaller aperture. Let me show you. So none of these others are principal rays, but there's still light going from the object and hitting the image. That means the image is still going to form. This is something we know if we think about it, because we know the irises in our eyes, or in this case, my cat's eyes, automatically open and close to let in more or less light so that we get the appropriate amount of light uh, for our eyes to function. That's what we have to do in a camera. We have to open or close this thing called an aperture to let the appropriate amount of light through, depending on the shutter speed and the, the speed of the film or sensor. Let's look at another camera and how it handles this. This ring right here represents how much we want to block the light uh, coming into the camera. It's called the aperture setting. And the lower numbers mean more open. So this lens uh, can be blocked to f16, which is a pretty small aperture. And the most open it can be is f2.8. These are standard numbers across the photographic industry. So these cameras are SLRs. And photographers like SLRs because there's no separate viewfinder. The lens that actually takes the photo sends uh, the image both to where the film is, which is like right here, and also to the viewfinder, which is right above it. So it has kind of a neat trick to do that. If we take the lens off, you can see it. Right now there's this uh, mirror and this prism up here, and they're sending light to the viewfinder, but when you go to take the picture, they get out of the way and uh, the image goes to where the film is. The problem is, is if you're looking through the viewfinder, you want as much light to get in as possible so you get a nice bright I image to look at. But then when you take the photo, you need to have the correct uh, light exposure based on your film speed and uh, your shutter settings. So these automatic cameras actually do something kind of cool. When you go to take the photo, they blink. And that doesn't change what you see on the picture. It just makes it dimmer. So right now, if you look through the viewfinder, you can see the Christmas tree pretty brightly. And all I'm going to do is make the lens blink and put that full aperture on. And you can still see the tree, it just gets dimmer. So we're blocking many rays when we close up that aperture, but we're certainly not taking away part of the image because every part of the image is formed by lots of rays coming from the object. 
Converging lenses are only one of the types of optics you need to know. We also need to know diverging lenses and concave and convex mirrors. But I thought practice with the different rays and looking at patterns on how when we change the location of an object, the location of the image changes as well. I thought that might be helpful. I also wanted you to see how we can harness this in useful real-world technology.